We're going to come then to our reading, and uh, Ross is going to bring that to us this morning. The reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that, that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man, man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Here endeth the reading. Amen. Now, of course, at this point, you agree with me. That's the most important passage in the whole Bible, don't you? I like that. You know, I... I don't know. I don't know. What, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing? I think that it is an, it's an amazing passage. Don't you think? I love it. I just, I mean, I, I love, the, I love the, 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 the drama of the passage. But I need to put you into context because I know all of you know the history of Israel backwards and forwards. I know that. Um, but just in case, just in case you know, you're having trouble putting it all together, let's, let's give you some context about this. Okay, so we've got Abraham. Remember Abraham? Okay, so he starts as Abram. Okay, and then we've got Abram and Sarai, who of course becomes Sarah. That's right. Okay, and so they come from Ur of the Chaldeans, which of course is in Mesopotamia. Okay, modern day Iraq. That's right. So in Iraq is where they would come from. And then they travel to Haran, and then they come into the promised land, and they live happily for a short time, for a short time, which is very much the history of Israel. The history of Israel is to live happily for a short time. And so the reality of it is, is that they live there in the promised land for a while. Of course, they have no children, uh, at least Abram's got children, but uh, Sarai and Abram don't. But then God gives them a child, and his name is Isaac. That's it, Isaac, the one who makes me Laugh. Ooh, the one who makes me laugh. I love it. Okay. Remember what Abram means? Father of the, of the tribe. Father of a tribe is Abram. But then, of course, once he has Isaac, he gets renamed to Abraham. The father of many tribes. Okay. Yeah. Are you getting something out of that? That names... Is an importance with names. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. So we got Isaac, and Isaac then lives happily for a short time. Okay, so we have Isaac doing his thing. And then, of course, Isaac has two sons. Okay, like all of us who are blessed with two sons. He was blessed with two sons, but they were twins. Okay, they were twins. And the first one to come out was Esau. And of course, he came out looking a little red. And that's why they called him Esau. Okay, because he was red. He was ruddy uh, in terms of, you know, I think, I think he must have been the one who, who got most of the food inside, you know. And then the runt came out afterwards. Okay, he came out second. And he came out holding on to 
you know, holding on to the foot of his brother as he came out. It's, uh, it tells you something about his personality. And he called him Jacob. Jacob. Okay, we'll talk about what Jacob means just now. But the reality of it is Jacob comes out and then he's, he's there. And one thing that you need to realize about Jacob is that he was a cunning con artist right from the beginning. I mean, right from the beginning, I think the reason why he was holding on to, to Esau's foot was that, in fact, he was trying to get out first. And all the way through, from that point onwards, he was upset the fact that he came. He came second. And you remember, come on, you know the story, that one day Esau came back from the, from the fields very tired and very hungry, and Jacob had been cooking. I always find that quite funny. Don't you love it when a man cooks in the Old Testament? You know that he's up to something then, man. You know? And so he was cooking some lentil stew. And of course, Esau comes in and says, oh, gee, that smells nice. Can I have some of that? And Jacob says, of course, you're my brother. I love you so much. Here, have some lentil stew. Does he? No. He says, I'll give you some if you... If you give me your birthright. Now, I think that Esau was big, but not, not quite as brainy as maybe he should have been. And so what happens is he says, yes, okay. Thinking that, of course, his brother's not going to. He's never going to execute it. But they grow up and they do their thing. And, of course, Esau then goes blind. And then they have to get their birthright. And what does Esau do? Well, at least what does Jacob do? He listens to mum. And mum says to him, hey, go to your father and go and get him to give you his, his blessing. And so what does he do? He puts on sheepskin. A sheepskin uh, covers on his arms because Esau was, yeah, I love what you remember, isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it fantastic? You see, and then they say that Sunday school wasn't useful. There we go. You remember the whole hairy thing with Esau. Absolutely. And so the thing, of course, is that Isaac goes in and Isaac, uh, Isaac, uh, sorry, Jacob goes in and Isaac then feels his arms and says, oh, that's Esau. And he then blesses him and gives him the blessing of the firstborn. And of course, Esau takes it really well. <laughs> no. Esau says, I'm going to, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill my brother. Echoes of Cain and Abel happening here, doesn't it? And so what does Jacob do like every good coward does? He runs. He runs. In fact, he runs the entire length of Israel. In fact, he runs right out of Israel and into another country. He runs back to Haran. But on the way, on the way, something happens. Do you remember what happens? He gets a, yes, I could see someone's, someone's doing this to me. Yes, that's right. He has a dream. Jacob's ladder. Oh, goodness, the way we talk about ladders. It wasn't a ladder at all. It must, must probably be what we would call a ziggurat. But let's not get into that. That's a different story for a different day. But he has a meeting with God. He meets with God because he sees the angels going up and down and going to heaven and coming back to earth. And what he realizes is that the God that he's been hearing about since he was young actually does exist. That the God that he's believed in, well, that he's not really believed in, actually does exist. And a beginning happens, a change happens in Jacob's heart. But he goes to Ran. He keeps running because he's worried that Esau is going to want to kill him. In fact, he wasn't paranoid. It was real. And so he goes to Haran. And I love the story in Haran. I mean, come on. You need to go and read that. It's in, it's in Genesis. And, and go and read the story again. Because the con artist gets conned. Don't you love it when that happens, though? You know? There's something about that when the con artist actually gets conned. And, of course, he gets conned by his future father-in-law. Because, of course, he falls for one girl. And, of course, that's why you always got to take up the veil before you say, I do. You know? Don't say, I do, until you've seen who's under the veil. A couple of weeks ago, I did a wedding. 
And I said, you know, are you going to be wearing a veil? And she said, no. I said, well, that's a good thing. Because what happened with Jacob? He married the wrong sister. Gee, I love it when a con artist gets conned. Isn't it excellent? And so then, of course, his father-in-law says to him, no, okay, you can have the other one too if you like. But you've got to work for me for another seven years to get her. Oh, come on, that's true love, isn't it? 14 years to get her. And of course, then he gets her. So now he's got two wives. And by the way, he's also got their servants. But anyway, we won't get into that either. And so the reality of it is, is that he's now been away a long time. And he's become a wealthy man. He's become a prosperous man, not only in terms of wealth, in terms of flocks and herds, but he's now got two wives and he's got two concubines and he's got 11 sons. Ah, oh, come on. In Israel, that was a man who was particularly blessed. And so he says, now listen, it's enough now. We've been living as refugees in Haran for all this time. It's time to go back to the land of my ancestors. And so he's, he's terrified. He is terrified of what Esau is still going to do, and whether Esau is still angry with him. And so don't you love the story? He's still a coward. Because you notice what he does? Is he goes down to the river Jabbok. Now, of course, the river Jabbok is one of the entry points into the Holy Land. And he goes all the way down to there. And then what does he do? He sends his wives and his sons and his flocks and his herds ahead of him. I love it. That's the work of a, of a wonderful coward, isn't it? Because if Esau does something, you'll do it to them, not to him. Oh, good on you. It's kind of testing the waters. And then this weird story happens. And I don't know about you, but I love the weird stories of the Bible. I love the stories of the Bible, which are the unexpected stories, the, the stories that you, you go, what? What? Why? What? What? Because those stories often are the ones which are the most important. And that's what happens here. It says a man started wrestling with him. And you go, what? Who is he? Is he from Esau? Is he from the environment? Is he just somebody who wants to rob him? What, what's happening? But he's none of those things, because by the end of the passage, what we realize is that the man who's doing the wrestling is, in fact, a representative from God. Now, this makes it only more weird, doesn't it? I mean, I could understand it better if Esau had sent an assassin or someone to go and, you know, take him out. But that's not the case. And notice that they fight all night. Now, come on, Jacob must have been some guy. It says that he fought with him all night and he couldn't overcome him. I love it. He may have been a coward, but when he had to stand and fight, boy, he could. It makes me feel better because, you know, you scratch deeply and you get yellow. But there are times when I, I stand. And notice that Jacob stands. And he fights him all night. And then, of course, by the end of it, it says that the dawn is rising. And so what does the angel do? He cheats. So you never knew that God cheated, did you? Because, of course, he cheats. What does he do? He touches his hip and dislocates his hip. And I love it. Can you, can you see the Hollywood version of this? You know, angel wrestling with Jacob all night. And then when just as the sun's about to rise, the angel touches his hip and he dislocates his hip. And what does Jacob do? He holds on. I like that. He kind of holds on. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you, until you bless me. Until you bless me. Then the angel says to him, what's your name? He says, Jacob. He said, from now onwards, your name will be Israel, Israel, Israel. And then that's it. That's the story. And I know now, now you see why it's such an important one, don't you? It's absolutely vital one for us. 
and particularly for us as Christians. Because the thing with it is, is that it's this story that sets up so much of the rest of our relationship with God. Because notice that that's what this story is about. It's about Jacob's relationship with, with God. Remember, Jacob wasn't the, the hero guy. Jacob wasn't the superhero. In fact, if we were going to choose the superhero, we would choose Esau. Have you seen Chris Hemsworth as Thor? Take, takes me back whenever I see Chris Hemsworth because he's got that look, you know, you know, the whole chiseled triangular, you know, upside down triangle thing, the six pack. I've got a six pack as well, more like a keg. But I remember when I was a kid, you know, we used to have Charles Atlas. Do you remember Charles? Some of you are, you know, some of you might remember Charles Atlas. Ah, oh, man, I loved it. Because I used to read comics in those days, particularly military comics. I loved those. But at the back of every military comic was one of those things that you could buy, the Charles Atlas chest expander. Do you remember that? The what, bull worker. Oh, that sounds even better than chest expander. Absolutely. You know. But all it really was was a piece of rubber, piece of rubber tubing, which actually you know had two handles on it. And the idea with it is, is that you would get this thing, and then every you go, and you just you know keep pulling it until you you got a chest. Didn't work, by the way. I invested a fair amount of my hard-won cash into that, and it didn't work. You see, that's what I think of with a hero, don't you? Don't you think of Charles Atlas or Chris Hemsworth? Or, you know? And then I think of Jacob. And I look at him and I go, yes, that's my man. He's a whole lot more like me. You know, I think that he was always the weedy one. I think he was always the, the kind of the one was, was second. And in fact, that's the reality that we see with, with Jacob. Is that he's the one that God chooses. And I think the reason why is that God doesn't always choose the one that you would expect. I mean, we see it all the way through the Old Testament, through the Tanakh, is that God chooses on a different scale. Remember when they were going to choose who was going to be the king? This was after Saul. And Samuel saw David's brothers. And as they came past, he looked at them and saw that they looked good. And look, ruddy. He said, that must be the one. And God said, it's not. The one that was chosen was, in fact, the, the youngest one. Gee, that would have been interesting. Our sovereign King Charles might not necessarily. Might have to give it to, uh, to George. Might have King George instead. The reality of it is, is that when it comes down to it, what we realize with this is that God chooses Jacob. And God chooses Jacob because he's the one who's going to further the things that God would do. And you know, I think that when you look at Jacob, when you look at his story, his story is all one connected with this event. And in fact, not just because of that, but he's given the name Israel. This is where the name Israel comes from. Before this moment, there is no Israel. This is the beginning of Israel. And if we say that it, for us, even as Christians, we are grafted into Israel, then this is where we begin. This is our origin story. And that's why I think that this story is so important, because it tells us the origins of who we are. It tells us about how we come to be. It tells us about who we're supposed to be and understand ourselves as Christians. Now, what can we understand? Well, number one is the importance of a name. The importance of a name. Now, as I already said, you notice that everybody's name has got significance, whether it be Abram or Abraham, whether it be Isaac, whether it be Esau and Jacob. Now, Jacob's name, the name Jacob, means supplanter. 
the one who follows. And generally what it means is the one who follows by taking over. So he's the guy that you don't employ because he wants your job. You know? <laughs> if you're the CEO of the company, he's the guy you go, no, let's not get him. Because all that he wants to do is to take my, my job. That's what Jacob means. Now, funny enough, it's my second name. I've got the French version of this name. Because, of course, the French version is Jacques. Jacques. So my name is Martin, which means warlike. Jacques, which means the one who takes over. Every morning I look at myself in the mirror and say, Martin Jacques. No, I don't. But, you know, the thing is that, that when, you, when, you, when you look at Jacob, it's just he's the one who's going to take over. He's, he's the one who's going to do everything to get on top. He's the one who's going to, to, to always be the one who tries to to supplant his brother. And he get given a new name. Not a name that's actually saying, I'm going to be on top. Not the same name. I'm going, to be the, I'm, going to be the, I'm going to supplant my brother. I'm going to be the big deal. Instead gets the name Israel. Israel. Israel, of course, means to struggle with God. To struggle with God. You see, I think that when we look at that story, it is the most important aspect of what we need to understand of being Israel. One of the things that you will see even in the Tanakh about the Jews is that he calls them a stiff-necked people. A stiff-necked people. Do you know what that means to be a stiff-necked? I know some of you know that generally because you've got stiff necks, but... If you're using it metaphorically, it means that you're someone who doesn't naturally do this. If you stiff necked, you is the sky blue? Is God good? Stiff necked people. Those are the people who don't automatically he say. Yes. So what are you? Are you Israel? Are you somebody who automatically says yes? Now I know some of you very well. And those that I know very well, I know a number of you are not easy yes people at all. But you know, the thing with it is, is that what I think that the reason why this passage is so important is because of that name, Israel. Because how is that a blessing? I mean, he tells the angel, I want you to bless me. And it says the angel said, from now on, would you be called Israel? And he blessed him. How is it a blessing? Well, it's a blessing because it changes who he is. He's no longer Jacob. He's no longer that one who has to constantly strive to be number one. He's no longer the one who has to supplant everybody else. He now becomes the one who has struggled with, with God. That's an important change. And the reality, what makes that a blessing is because it changes the relationship with God. Now, if God says to you, jump, what do you do? Yeah, I, I used to, my PTI when I was in the Navy, um, I think I've told you before that he had two brain cells. Uh, he was 18 years old. And not that that's the big deal, but he was 18 years old. And all of us, you know, theologues or padres, <laughs> midshipmen, were around about 24 to 26 because we had all done our training. And so we were all ordained already, we were all reverence, um, my little platoon of nine. And uh, he loved that because it meant that he tried to, 
make us feel as uncomfortable as possible. You know, he constantly would tell us how bad we were at running and everything else. But then he would also swear to us. And one day he said, I'm your PTI. When I say jump, you. And then one of the guys, and I just thought, shut up. It was a rhetorical question, man. One of the guys said, we ask how high. He said, no, you don't. You jump as high as you can. And then he made us run because we talked back. Never talk back to a PTI. But is that what God does? So when God tells you to jump, you just jump as high as you can? No. No, because that's what robots do. That's what slaves do. That's not what children do. I know, I've got two of them. And when I tell them to jump, they look at me and go, what? What are you on, Dad? Do you know the funny thing is? Is that this passage is where Jacob is given that authority. He's given the authority to, to ask. Why? Why should I jump? Why should I do what you want me to do? You see, one of the things that the Christian church did was it became imperial in about 320 AD under Constantine. It became the imperial religion of Rome. And from that point onwards, because of course it now was the Roman religion, you no longer could say, why? You just had to, had to do it. And so when Rome said, hey, there's these infidels taken over Jerusalem, take up your swords and let's go and kill them. Everybody in Christendom said, why? No, they didn't. They just said, yes, sir. When in Germany, Hitler told the Christian church that all the Jews should be exterminated and the gypsies and the communists and the black people and the mentally handicapped people, the German people who were some of the most sophisticated cultural people in the world said, why? No, they said, yes. Why did we do that? Because our Christianity became a Christianity not about Israel. Because in Israel, we were given the authority to say, why? Why do you want me to do this? And that's why when you read the Bible, the question that you always need to ask yourself is the question, why? When Jesus tells us to love our neighbors, our first answer shouldn't be, yes, sir. Our first question should be, why? And I'm not talking about the kind of why that comes out of a lack of belief. I'm coming out of the kind of why that wants to build relationships. Because you see, the thing that Israel did, the reason why it's a blessing is because what it does is it changes our relationship with God. Is that a relationship with God is no longer a God and a servant or a God and a slave, but in fact, a God and his child. There are times when, in fact, when I tell my sons to do something and they come out with why, and I just want to say, just do it. And if you look at the Old Testament, there is times when God gets a bit exasperated with Israel as well. But the truth of it is, the truth of this passage is that God wants to give us the opportunity to have a real relationship with him. And that real relationship is only possible when we are Israel. When we have the ability to ask why. Secondly. Israel, the one who struggles with, with God. How many of you like struggling? Yeah. None of us do. Come on. We've created all these labor-saving devices. And haven't they been good for us? Hasn't it been excellent? 
you know, everything is instant. Instant coffee. Remember when that came out? Instant coffee. Churches love instant coffee, man. Imperial roast. Mmm. Yummy, yummy, yummy. I'm not even sure there was any coffee in it. It was pure chicory, man. In fact, pure trickery, actually. But instant coffee. You don't have to wait. Come on, yes, you have to wait five minutes for it to percolate. Oh, too long. Let's have it quickly. Instant photos. Remember when the Polaroid came out? All the people nothing about the Polaroid cameras. Oh, look, there's the photo. Now, every camera, I mean, come on, everybody's got one. Good Lord, there's so many photos going around the world right now. It's ridiculous. I've been working on the cam on my photos on my computer. I found out I got 40,000. I got 40,000 photos. I've been recording all my sermons for the last five years. I've got 10 terabytes of video. Most of which will never see the light of any day. I'm going to donate them to the library in my name. <laughs> I, can be, I can be trialed for heresy and absentia. We don't like struggle. And yet you need to understand that without struggle, there is no growth. You never grow when everything is going well. In fact, when everything is going well, when everything is prosperous, when everything is doing what it should do, the reality of it is we don't grow except fat. We sedate. The reason why we called Israel is because, in fact, Christianity is meant to be a, a struggle. I was talking to someone this week, and they were saying how struggle, how much of a struggle their life is, and particularly their, their Christian life. And they said that they're struggling. Am I really a Christian? Am I really doing what God wants me to do? And they said, I'm not even sure I'm a Christian anymore. I said, you know what? The fact that you are struggling proves to me that you are. It's the Christians who say, oh, I'm a Christian and everything is purely wonderful and I'm living in cloud nine and, you know, the land of milk and honey. Those are the ones that I worry about. Because the truth of it is, is that it always comes in struggle. Christianity was never meant to be a religion of ease and comfort and prosperity. It was meant to be one that struggles, that takes up its cross every day and does what God calls us to do. And that's a struggle. And sometimes that struggle isn't just in the things we're supposed to do, but a struggle against God himself. You will know for yourself. But even in relationships, relationships grow in struggle. Much more than they grow when everything is perfect. Thirdly and lastly, is the word blessing. And I think too often we misunderstand that word blessing. Because we assume that blessing means that everything is going to go well. As I told you about the history of Israel, is the history of Israel is they live in the land of milk and honey for a short time. But regardless of what happens to them, God gives them his blessing. Because what is a blessing? The blessing is in terms of its outcome, and that might not always be prosperity or well-being or health or wealth or prosperity or fame or any of those other things. In fact, so often what blessing is and what the Bible wants to tell us blessing is, is that which draws us closer in relationship to God and ourselves and others. That's the blessing. And being Israel is what enables us to to do just that. I pray that we may hold on to that blessing and that God may give us that blessing. 
You understand now why I think this passage is so important? You understand now why I think that this passage actually is the fundamental framework for all of our Christian life. Our Christian life is based in the name that we've been given, the name of being part of Christ. This passage wants to tell us that, in fact, in Christ, we can have a newness of life, a newness of perspective, but that comes in struggle. And it's in struggle that we find our, our blessing, where we grow closer to God and to ourselves and to each other. And in the end, that's really the foundation of what all Christianity is about. It's what Christ came to do. He came to enable us to be able to struggle, to be blessed, and to own the name that we've received. We've been given another name as well. It's called Christian. And as Christians, we are grafted into Israel. And as Israel, we are called to struggle and to bless. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that we may always remind ourselves that we are called Israel. And as Israel, we are called to go and to struggle in your name. Sometimes even to question you. To question what you would call us to do to question what you would call us to be. For it's in our questioning that we find our growth. So help us, Lord, to grow in you and in your love for us, in all that we do. In Jesus' name. Amen.